event in the spring. I mean, okay, so not all. Uh, for a while, we've been talking here at CHA. <clears throat> how, how can we, how can we maximize our assistance offered to our families? And this is one of the things that uh, came to the forefront that we could do. And so we uh, did a lot of praying and thinking and talking and uh, had an event last spring. We had four individuals, which uh, I believe uh, your there's a contact sheet, ministry and help contacts. Uh, the four gentlemen that were with us in the spring are on there. That's uh, John Wolf, Jerry Wright, Brett Hendricks, and Matt Mosley. So those four were with us. And uh, the after that event, which was really just basic kind of a, a pornography awareness, uh, it's out there. It's not good. A lot of us, uh, uh, this my generation who have children in school, high school, we don't know a lot about that and what's going on. So that's why that first event. <clears throat> we took some uh, a, a survey, took a Q&A, comment cards, people emailed us. The most common uh, thing that we heard from people after that event was, thank you, that was helpful, but I don't know how to protect my children. So we need some hands-on help. That was the number one thing we heard. So we started thinking and talking at that time. And uh, I had met Diana at that time. And uh, so I've talked with her quite a bit since then. And that this is what she does. Uh, she has a company. She also is on that sheet, Diana Giles, uh, thecomputermonkey.com. And this is what she does. She helps businesses and um, individuals with a variety of computer needs, but one of those is uh, setting up internet filters and accountability software. Some of you read my email, perhaps, uh, at my church, Faith Bible Church in Edmond, uh, a week and a half ago, a week ago Sunday, uh, had an event much like ours was in the spring, kind of an awareness event, and um, the things that were shared there, Dr. John Fobert, uh, a believer, a member of Faith Bible Church, and uh, research professor at Oklahoma State University, and the things he shared uh, were, and I, I thought maybe I was past the shock stage, but I was surprised that I was shocked. I just thought, ah, oh. it was. Just, he said, if it's not uh, disgusting uh, and, and nauseating to you, then then I've not done my job. It's like, okay, so it was just very unpleasant and uncomfortable. Uh, the things that Dr. Fobert uh, shared, but again, it was, it's it's not getting any better, folks. Pornography is not going away. It's increasing in its insidiousness. Uh, I used that word and I looked it up. It means uh, uh, presenting itself as harmless and yet being very, very damaging. That's what the word insidious means, okay? And it is very insidious. Uh, they're going after young ladies now. The market is going after the girls because the men's market is saturated. There aren't any more customers to get to in the, in the male market. That market is saturated. So now they're trying to sell porn and they're being successful to young ladies, okay? So we all have children, some of us sons, daughters, son, daughters, and some of us both. Uh, they need our help. They need our protection. Uh, there is a battle being waged and it's in many, many areas, but one of them and one of the most important ones is in this area of pornography. So we're just really committed to doing whatever we can to help. So this event, we're already talking about the one we're going to have next spring. Not sure what that's going to be. Got some ideas. We're praying. I'm praying. Just ask the Lord to give me direction. How can we continue? This needs to be an ongoing discussion. Okay, it's not going to go away and we need to keep it on people's radars to be aware of and then fight the fight against pornography. So that's what Diana is going to do for us tonight. She's going to do a, a, a little bit of um, kind of a recap of what we did last spring. So if you weren't here, she'll, she'll go through that a little quickly. We've talked about it. But uh, she will do that and just kind of some stats and, and perhaps some shocking things to you. And then, um, then most of the time, though, she's going to talk about how to uh, protect some electronic devices in your home. It's going to be pretty technical. But hey, it's a router. It's an iPhone. Okay, it's technical. She's going to get a little technical, but you need that help. Don't despair if you say, oh, I, I can't do that. I can't follow her. She's going to give you some website tips. Uh, your, her contact info is here. You can call her. She'll help you. You can hire her to come to your house and just do it for you. We've already had some CHA parents do that. She just, just come do it for you, okay? Now, not for free, okay? <laughs> you need to pay for her time. She has a husband and children too, uh, but she's done this in her own home. 
so that's why we had Diana come tonight, all right? Uh, a believer uh, goes to uh, crossing this community, and she was at Faith Bible the other night at the event. Diana and I talked to there. And uh, so she stays up with what's going on and wants to help parents. So again, uh, Diana, thank you for coming tonight. Let me take a moment and pray for us, and then we will get started. First of all, does everyone have, you should have two handouts, the notes, sensible cyber pairing. Those are Diana's notes, which we will go through. And then a contact sheet. I'll say more about that at the end. And then this book, uh, this is actually given to us uh, by Keith Burkhart. This was actually the program to the Southern Baptist Men's Rewired Retreat a couple of years ago. I think it was a couple years ago. So, but in the back there, there's a book, Sexual Detox by Tim Chalice. It's very good. Uh, I would encourage you to read it and then pass it along to somebody else. It's, it's very, very good, all right? So that's just a gift to you. Uh, Kurt, Keith Burkhart gave them to us and encouraged us to hand them out. So there you are, all right? So thank Keith Burkhart and the uh, Baptist General Convention for, for those books, okay? Anything I missed, Diana? Let me pray for us, and then we'll turn it over to her. Father, we are grateful for tonight. Thank you for these parents. Pray that you would make this time beneficial for us. We thank you for Diana, for her preparation. Uh, Lord, just pray that you'd give her a complete ease and comfort as she speaks to us. Uh, Lord, pray that you'd allow us to understand, uh, first of all, the urgency of setting up some protection for our families. And then, Lord, some insight and uh, some uh, perhaps uh, expertise and in, in learning some expertise and how to do that. Uh, and Lord, I just pray that you would allow uh, these parents to leave and, and, and really do, put into action, take the steps necessary to protect their sons and daughters uh, from what we're going to talk about tonight, the, 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 really the dangers, uh, the damage of pornography. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless this evening tonight. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Diana? Is my mic on? I think it is. Okay. Uh, it's great to see you all here tonight. Uh, it, it really is a pleasure that you're here because I know that that means you have a heart for the same thing I do, which is protecting children, your children, uh, from pornography. And so uh, I thank you for being here on behalf of your children. Uh, just a little bit about me, uh, I went to Oklahoma State University. I have a bachelor's in business and a master's in telecommunications management. Uh, I have had uh, numerous jobs in the uh, IT industry since about 1994, uh, or I guess 93. That's what my thing says, so uh, something like that. But I did take some time off when I had my children. My uh, oldest son was born in 1997. so. Uh, through that, uh, my connections I already had, and through friends and family, it, it seemed like I was always having people come to me to help, when, help them with their computer issues. So uh, that has happening enough, and I had some businesses I was working with even, so I decided to make it official and start a business. So uh, it's been a part-time business, but one that worked really well with um, raising my family, and uh, so, you know, it, it's been a great blessing, and, and as they've gotten older, uh, I've gotten busier, and so that, that works out, worked out pretty good. Uh, I have uh, my children, I was talking about Blake and Dylan, they go uh, to Edmond North High School. One's a senior, one's a sophomore, and my husband, Steve Giles, um, he is not the clothing store guy, if you've seen that clothing store. Um, he's the veterinarian. But uh, anyway, we, uh, we've been married 25 years. We celebrated this summer. And uh, I'm just happy to be here with you guys tonight. I um, want to uh, get right into this issue. And since we are limited a little bit on time, um, and you all, many of you did attend the event in the spring, I'm going to kind of blaze through some of the pornography statistics and the things like that that I have that I might spend a little more time on with, with another group. But uh, the problems, you know, that come with the Internet, uh, there are problems. But there are also a lot of great things. You know, there's these websites that you can connect with people who are suffering from an illness. Um, there's homework helps. And... There are recipes and, and there's numerous things that you can, you know, do with the internet. It's a great, great tool. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of horrible and 
and disgusting and, and violent and grotesque things that we have to deal with as well. And so in our connected society, you know, we're not going to, typically, we're not going to just completely avoid the internet. We're going to try to use it and, and do the good things with it, but we need to be able to, way, we need to, be able to have a way to avoid the uh, bad things. Now, media and society typically will kind of um, put emphasis on some other things, like cyberbullying and um, they, they abductions, you know, they're always talking about that. Well, those things are real and horribly tragic. And, you know, we've all heard the uh, stories in the news about children who've committed suicide from being, you know, from cyberbullying. And I'm not minimizing that at all. But I'm saying that the media tends to focus on things that are maybe percentage-wise, statistically less likely. And what is more common and more um, likely to harm your child and cause them uh, emotional problems and even marriage problems down the line is pornography. So um, not to minimize the really serious things that can happen, but they just are percentage-wise very unlikely or less likely. You know, that, uh, I think the percentage of somebody being abducted, I believe it was less than half a percent. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But uh, WebMD, you know, listed cyberbullying, sexual predators, pornography was third, okay? Um, then another article, identity theft and virus things, you know. Well, those can harm my computer, and that would be a real inconvenience, but I would much rather have that than my child see uh, pornography. They uh, just listed inappropriate content third again. So I, uh, I really wanted to bring to light uh, the pornography issue. There's so many parents who, who just aren't taking it seriously, and you all are because obviously you're here. Uh, so I appreciate that. But this is what uh, they, the media focuses on. I say there's another real danger that people are just kind of ignoring, uh, and often, not always. But they uh, put these devices in their kids' hands, and um, they're really just inviting the world and the worldly world into their um, life with that. So... Uh, these are the reasons, and there are many more, but um, I even have among my, my good friends, people who have given me these excuses as to why they don't have parental controls on their devices. Um, they trust their kids. They've told them not to. You know, They've put the fear of God into them. Uh, and also, they have girls. Well, as um, Mr. Bullard touched on, that is not really a reason not to. Uh, they're targeting girls just as much as they are boys, and it may not be as much of a problem among girls, but it is, it is certainly not just a boy issue. And uh, another reality, sadly, is that some of the controls that I recommend and some of the best ones would also interfere with a parent's access to pornography. And so they don't necessarily like that inconvenience if that's something that they're participating in. Uh, and the other thing is inconvenient. So um, the, the thing about the convenience is it's gotten so much better. Uh, about 10 years ago, when, when I was trying to you know, first secure our devices, our computers, back then you know, it was pretty much just a computer, uh, the parental controls really weren't very good. Thankfully, they have gotten a ton better. There are so many more products. There are so many uh, better products. The ones that are out there have, have you know, um, been improving over the years because I've been following them and, and working with some of them. So that's, that's something that's really good for now. Uh, but I would ask you, if you're talking about something, if, you know, if you are a parent who thinks, well, I don't really need to do that, what about other dangerous things like... Um, you know, you, would you leave a gun on the coffee table? Well, no, because your child could hurt themselves. You wouldn't leave uh, drugs on the uh, coffee table or that kind of thing. But um, you, you may uh, look at something a little bit less, okay, you say, yeah, yeah, they can kill themselves with a gun or drugs, that kind of thing. Okay, well, what about a book on satanic worship? Would you put that on the coffee table? 
You know, people might gasp and say, well, no, I wouldn't do that. Okay, well, would you put a Playboy on the table, <laughs> on the coffee table? No, I would never do that. Well, you pretty much are if you have it on your computer or their phone or their iPad or their Kindle without controls. That's just the reality of it. You, you are. And so um, that's why I'm trying to urge people to, to take care of this. Um, again, the media, you know, it's funny. It, it, they joke about pornography. It's just something that's no big deal. Um, there, it's, there's articles in magazines all over now about how it's good for you. It's good for your marriage, good for your sex life, you know, those kind of things. So reality is it is not. It is a sin that can often lead to a serious stronghold in someone's life and destroy a marriage, uh, you know, certainly has prob caused problems with intimacy in a relationship. And also, I don't know if you're aware or not, but the pornography industry really drives a lot of the human trafficking industry and there, you know, and prostitution, which also is related to human trafficking. So, you know, one drives the other. The demand for one drives the other. So that is uh, another reason to despise pornography. Uh, some statistics from Covenant Eyes, who provides a product that we'll talk about tonight. 67% of children admit to clearing their internet history to hide their activity. And 79% of accidental exposure takes place in the home, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and 56% of divorce cases involve one party having an obsessive internet uh, porn problem. Here are some others. Uh, the statistics about how early the children have seen it, at what ages. You know, some of these are older. I have a feeling they're probably going down because there's more little kids who are having access to iPads and those kind of devices. And just so... Um, you know, we put it out there, I think as soon as your child, because there are some people who say like age 10, you know, maybe is when you should worry about controls. I say as soon as they have access to a device that's connected to the internet. So they could be five. I mean, you know, there's some of these iPads or things like that that they're playing with. Now, if you've given them access to an iPad that doesn't have Wi-Fi access, doesn't have, you know, a data plan or something, well, then it's not going to get on the internet. But if it's connected to the internet and your child has access to it, uh, I would even say even supervised access, okay, because something could pop up on the screen <laughs> before you could really do anything about it, and then, you know, they could have seen something really horrible that, you know, frightens them, confuses them, and so uh, I say as soon as, uh, what it, there's really not too much of an age that's too young these days, the way kids are using uh, devices. So uh, these are some statistics that were, I, I also went to the, uh, the talk uh, by John Fobert the other night, and he gave me permission to use some of his slides because there were some st statistics that he had that were uh, a little bit more recent years than uh, some things that I had. So these just kind of talk about just how prevalent it is and, um, a little bit about their age of exposure. This, he, then the next slide is about Christian women. This one is Christian men. And you'll see that there's not a huge difference between Christian and non-Christian. So it's, it's one of those things that sadly I think is, um, it's in the church. Um, it's a way that, that Satan uh, gets his hooks into Christians and it's not being talked about that much in most churches. And so it's kind of going under the radar. Same thing here with women. Uh, yes, the use overall with women is less, but it is definitely still out there when, um, you know, 54% of Christian women, less often, but still, that means they were looking at it at some point. And this one is another statistic over Christian women. Uh, this is a poll from their newsletter, and... So 34% of the people who answered the poll uh, admitted to intentionally. This is not accidental. This is intentional. Now, the, uh, the thing that then they brought this up last spring, because I was, I was here, and it does chemically alter a child's brain when they are exposed to pornography. Those images 
um, or kind of make an imprint, and there's a pharmacological, a psychopharmacological response. Um, images that they see as a child can stay with them till they're into adulthood, and that's not as much, I mean, that is, you know, icky and that's a problem, but the problem is that if they're exposed to it, then they're going to be more likely to seek it out again. So, and then, you know, it becomes kind of uh, a habit or at least something that they're, that they're seeking out. Now, the, uh, the thing that even, you know, there were a few things that even shocked me um, in all the research I've done when I was uh, at the talk the other night by Dr. Frobert, and one of them was just how increasingly violent the pornography that's out there now is. It is uh, apparently just increasing dramatically. You've got 88% of the scenes in these videos uh, involving some sort of violence, and um, it's perpetrated against the women in the video, you know, uh, most likely. So, also, the uh, women in the videos, the, the pornography industry is so uh, profitable that there are people getting into the industry that maybe weren't in it before. You know, you kind of had big porn before, the, you know, just the, the, the people in, quote, porn Hollywood. Well, now it's, you know, Joe Schmo, Schmo out there who is, happens to be a, a pimp and he has uh, some ties to human traffic and well he decides he's going to make videos too because it's profitable. So a lot of these people that are these women um, that are in these videos are not there by choice. So not only is someone watching pornography but they could also be watching a crime take place because it is actually a rape or some you know some other forced participation. It also causes um, much more likelihood for someone to have violent or, um, you know, tendencies later on where they are going to act out something on another person, uh, these child molesters, and, and uh, even many of the uh, serial killers. Uh, pornography has been in their past. That is something that they kind of, you know, started with, so to speak. Uh, this lady who um, is a doctor up in Pennsylvania, this quote I thought was pretty uh, poignant because it talks about all of the people that she's dealt with that have had these different sexual um, related issues, you know, crimes or pornography addiction and so forth, that she had not treated one case of sexual violence that did not involve pornography. So it, it definitely uh, has much more serious consequences. It's not like, um, you know, we've, we've all seen probably movies where, you know, um, there's a little boy with a girly magazine under his mattress, and, you know, it's hee hee, and it's kind of funny. That's not what we're talking about. This is really horrible content that is accessible just with a few clicks of a mouse or your finger. So we talked, I talked a little bit about this. Um, one of the things I hadn't brought up um, was that, you know, how it affects a child as far as their healthy view, God's view of sex. They, you know, are exposed to something often if they're too young before they've even had, uh, you know, discussions with their parents about what, they don't even know what sex is, and yet they're faced with something that frightens them, scares them, confuses them, and then teaches them on top of that an altered view, not God's view of what sex is. So, um, the other thing that I think is, is really frightening is, as parents, Christian parents, we want our child, first and foremost, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And sin separates us from God. And so kids have a hard enough time, you know, to, just um, growing up and these issues that they're dealing with. And so adding one more thing that could cause them to be in in, you know, just a real stronghold situation that's going to keep them from growing in that, you know, faith relationship with Christ that we want them to have, I think um, is certainly serious enough to, you know, take note with. This is from a youth pastor. I have this on my website, on my homepage, because I thought it was so uh, good, but he says, we rightly claim that pornography is an addiction, but we don't seem to be challenging the dealers of this drug. 
Who are these dealers? Parents. Parents who foolishly give their teens and preteens free reign with their smartphones and by doing so have invited the world into their child's bedroom each night. That pretty much, I mean, that's what we're doing if we, if we give them their devices without anything. This is a story um, from a woman who is a custo- was a customer of mine uh, who came to me to help with parental controls because her son already had a pornography addiction. And, um, you know, she said that he had been first exposed, ironically, at a Christian school. And uh, so it was through another, you know, in the computer lab, another little boy showed him the images. But she wrote this for me for this um, seminar because she wanted to, you know, just to urge parents, really, to not make the mistakes she did, to start early and start young and uh, put the controls in place. So I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but we know pornography is bad, I think, as Christians. Here are some verses that kind of, you know, would substantiate that. Uh, It is adultery, even if you look upon another uh, woman or man, um, you know, in lust, then you are sinning. And... This one from the Sermon on the Mount, I know Christ is talking about our focus, but with God's Word, you know, it's so layered and like an onion. Um, Another, this is, you know, another way we can kind of look at this is keeping your eyes clean and pure and what we look upon. So, uh, you know, just another, just another way to, to look at God's Word. I really, um, because of my feeling about his word, and, and, and I'm first bringing this seminar to Christian families. To me, the two can't really be separated if you're talking to other people of faith, because he is there to help us through all of these things. And we look to his word to see, uh, you know, to know how to respond to things, to know what's right and wrong. And, and so um, that's why I bring faith into it. Uh, if I at some point, maybe we'll take this seminar to a non-faith-based group. I, you know, can certainly leave that kind of thing out. But I think, to me, it is, as parents, it's, it's all related. You know, we look to God's Word as our, as our light and our, our guide. So, now I know you guys are, this is like the good part, right? This is what you really want to know. <laughs> what do we do? But um, I would say you keep calm and you do something. <laughs> Because with parental controls, even doing something is better than nothing. And there's some very small some things you can do that will actually, um, in fact, probably the simplest and least expensive thing you can do for your home is actually one of the best things. And, and I do recommend a twofold approach, like, you know, that that's not enough. You can't just do that. But the basic thing that I'm going to talk about and show you is free, and it works. So... No excuses, <laughs> okay? There is no excuse to not protect your um, child's devices. Um, God is with us. He guides us as parents. Um, this verse from Isaiah, I just love, where it talks about he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young, and he will be there to help us. We have to do our part, but he will help. So you say, yeah, okay, so we just give it to God. No, Um, because I think if you just said, well, I'm just going to pray about it, that he'll protect my child, and I don't have to do anything. I'll just pray about it. Well, could he? Yes, he could, but you're not doing your part. I mean, he gives us resources. He gives us, um, you know, our devices, actually, and gives us friends and colleagues money to buy the things that we may need to buy. We have the resources. We need to do our due diligence and then trust him with the rest. And so it is your responsibility as a parent, um, if you're going to be a good steward of your child, to put controls on their devices. I have a friend who um, is also a customer came to me and wanted me to help with parental controls. She didn't have a, a real problem yet, but what she'd been doing was she was taking, every time her, she would leave the house, and her kids were old enough to stay at home by themselves, you know, at this point, but she would collect all of their devices, and she had a deadbolt lock on her master bedroom closet. 
and she would collect them all and put them in the closet and lock them up. So, yes, it was effective, but it wasn't very practical. But I will tell you, God honored her because, you know, her effort paid off. Um, one of her kids, her child, had a friend over, and the friend had his computer, and there was an incident where there was some pornography, and she was immediately alerted to it. Um, her son immediately came to her and told her about it, and so I think it was one of those things where, you know, I just think God honored her um, efforts, and uh, of course then we took care of it and some, with some better methods, uh, but I, I just thought her, her passion for it and her, her, her um, effort was so sweet, uh, just very cumbersome though. You know, we want controls that are going to be um, not effortless, but not a burden, okay? And let me tell you, they've been a burden. Ten years ago, parental controls were a real burden. They've gotten so much better. So, what do we do, okay? The first thing you need to do is look at your family's digital resources, everything that you have in your home that is connected to the internet. And it won't be long, I've seen some stuff, um, there's gonna even, and there may be already, but um, refrigerators even with monitors on the front, you know, access to the internet on your refrigerator. Anything that has access to the internet needs to have some sort of control on it. So you have to consider where is the device located, how many do we have, who's using them and what their ages are, and then will the device leave the house? Is it always going to be here? Is it, you know, a desktop that's plugged in, always going to stay here, or is it an iPad that may go somewhere else? And then you also want to consider practicality because you are not going to want to use the controls and your kids are going to drive you crazy about the controls if they're not practical. I realize that. Um, I am not saying, you know, that we need to do things that are going to just totally inconvenience us. Like, um, I remember at, at one point, this is way back when there just wasn't much available, I had set some up on, this is on Windows XP, and I mean, just every minute, my son was saying, Mom, can you enter the password again? And I was having to go in and put the password in to get, well, that's just not practical, you know, um, because it was, it was too cumbersome and too limiting. So we don't, we don't want that. That's why I named the seminar Sensible Cyber Parenting. So. so we assess your needs. First of all, do you have a router? Well, almost 100% of families nowadays, I think, do. Um, every, you know, because that's how you get to the internet to multiple devices. And it wasn't too long ago that you just had one router with a, I mean, one, one cable modem or DSL modem with a computer. But that's kind of changed now. Uh, how many devices, and you want to list them out, and then you want to list how they're connected. Are they wireless or are they wired? Because the wired, wireless ones are going to be leaving the house, typically. So you look at this, it's kind of like a little walkthrough here. If you have one device, which is probably pretty rare, but you're going to go with the parental control that's at the device itself, software on that device. If you have two or more, which most of us are going to fall into, you go to what type of connection is it? Is it wireless or is it wired? Well, if it's wireless or wired, you can do what's called router-based controls. And this is a router. You, you guys probably have some that maybe look a little different. If it's wireless, that the device usually is going to go somewhere else, and you're going to also want to do some applications on the device itself. Now, I typically recommend just, for, just to cover the bases, because I will tell you that with the Internet the way it is, and as good as the parental control products are, absolutely nothing is 100%. Okay, so here we're just trying to do the best we can uh, so I, t I like a two-fold approach. I like to protect the home by starting at the router and then add things to each device as necessary. And usually if you do it right with those, with the router and with the, the application on the device, they don't bump into each other. You don't have conflicts. What you don't want to do is put two, like on a computer, you wouldn't want to put two uh, products necessarily because they might kind of interfere with each other. Like you wouldn't use Covenant Eyes and Net Nanny on a computer because that would just, first of all, it cost you more money than you probably wanted to spend, but it would, they'd get in the way of each other. 
So the, I've talked about the things that never leave and mobile. Okay, we approach those differently. Uh, the things that leave, you're going to want to put it on the individual device with the things that stay at home. The router can take care of that, and then you can add things as you need to. And we'll talk about game consoles and TVs and things like that, um, too. But that, those are a little different. Okay, so router-based protection. What that is, is this is your router, and you, every device that uses your network has to go through this. The data traveling to it has to go through this router, or it can't get there. So there's a product by a company called OpenDNS, and their paying customers are large businesses, school systems, and things like that. That's where they make their money. So they're, because of that, they're very kind in offering their service to people for free. Now, there is a VIP version, which you can pay for, and it's $19.95 a year. Um, it's, you know, which is, I have that because I like the little extra features that it has, and I like to support them because I love what they're doing. Um, there are some other companies. There's one called MetaCert that we'll talk a little bit about. They are trying this as well, but their product isn't polished enough yet for prime time, at least for me to recommend. So, but I look for that in the future um, to also be an option. So what it does is it puts up a barrier uh, so that any device has to go through the router and it will, based on your choices of your, if you use the customized plan, which I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, it will, based on your control, it will say whether a website is okay or not on your network. The problem with, not the problem with this, but the problem with AT&T U-verse is you cannot use OpenDNS if you have AT&T U-verse. Because AT&T U-verse and any other company like them that offers only a proprietary router, meaning it's like their special router that they've had tweaked and designed to be just for their system, they don't let you uh, go in and make changes to it that will work. And there have been some people that have been successful um, to kind of double up and use two routers, but I have not been able to get that to work, and it's not going to be, um, for most people, it's not going to be an option. Unless you're pretty much a router expert, you may be able to get it to work. But, uh, and then AT&T is not going to like you to do it anyway. But, uh, so I would say just with Uverse, it's not an option. So, if, and, and Uverse has been making the rounds, I know they were making the rounds in my neighborhood and I was very disappointed that I wasn't home when they came by. Um, but if, if someone approaches you, if you don't have Uverse and they approach you about it, tell them that you might consider it, but they don't have router-based, um, they don't give you the option to have router-based parental controls. Because they will tell you they have parental controls. And what they mean is they have some software you can put on your computer that's a parental control. Well, that's not the same thing at all. So uh, that's my soapbox on Uverse. <laughs> um, so the single device options. You've got your laptops you can put software on, your apps that you can put on your phones and your iPads and things like that. Um, just these are kind of becoming more and more um, from the same people. And the companies, um, like the ones I'm going to talk about tonight, most of those have kind of now offered, they are offering a multitude of services. So they offer a service that will protect your computer and an iPad or a phone. And so they're kind of getting on the bandwagon of all combining those things. And you basically just pick how many users you have and, and so forth. So they, it can get expensive if you're going to do each individual device, but not as much now because of the... Um, the, the way the companies are kind of changing things, because they kind of had to. There's so many mobile devices. Uh, you need to have on mobile things something to protect when it leaves your home, for sure. Even if you, you know, were going to leave your desktop only with OpenDNS on your router, I would never do that on a device that leaves. Then you've got your built-in parental controls. And um, in your handout, I have a list uh, and kind of some links, some websites you can go to to get the instructions for the various like Xbox, PS3, and, and so forth. Um, these are proprietary parental controls. It's not like I can add a parental control. I can't buy a product and put it on 
an Xbox or a game, uh, a Wii, those game systems. But they all have parental controls built in, and they've gotten quite good. They didn't used to be as good, but they have gotten pretty good. And you can control a lot of things, but you have to go set it up. That's all. Um, it's mainly one of those things that you, you set it up and you just make sure you keep the password and uh, occasionally you may have to go in and, and loosen a restriction or do something. But once you set it on those, they pretty much, unless they come out with a big update and something's new, you don't have to do much with it. But you just have to take the time to do it. The same thing would be for your television, your remotes. Uh, I don't know how many of you have, have done that with your cable or satellite provider, but they have parental controls on those as well. Uh, same with the e-readers, um, the Kindle and the ones that are more like a tablet, more like a computer, those are more, um, those are going to be a little different, but I'm talking about the Nooks and the early Kindles that, uh, where they had internet access, but they don't really, it's, it's still the only control, because you can't download an app really for them, so the only control is the controls they built into the unit, and that's what I mean by proprietary. So if it doesn't have something you can put on it, it's going to have, typically, it's going to have parental controls. And then I would say, if it doesn't, don't buy it. You know, you know we, one of the things I, I tell people is, you know, use your pocketbook as a vote. <laughs> you know, don't buy a product that doesn't have controls. And then hopefully, I mean, I think that's why a lot of the companies have kind of gotten on board and they're starting to do more of that. So these are some products, and I'm going to go into each one of them a little bit, that I would recommend for a single device option, okay? And a single device option is, you know, what you're going to put on a particular device. It's not the router-based control. Uh, they, these are the things they all have in common, okay? And then I'm going to talk about how each one may have a little something different. But they all um, have the Apple's products, Android or Windows, and they all have uh, where you can go online and you can manage your child's account, and browsing history reports are available. Some of them, they're only available if um, you have the pay version, maybe not on the free version. Uh, time limits, there's, most of them have time controls now and then customizing your filter settings. You can a lot of times do it either way, where you say, I just want to block pornography, or you can get specific and say, you know, I also want to block this, and I also want to block that. And they are um, multi-user and multi-device, meaning they'll go, you can basically have an account, and you can say, okay, we have this device and this device, and we have these people. So you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. So Covenant Eyes um, are there this company is an outstanding advocate against pornography. And for anybody, especially, I mean, it's a good product, but it would be a product, I would say, if you had already someone in your family, whether they're a child or an adult who had a pornography problem, this is the product that you would go with. Because it has this added accountability where you can have somebody who's getting a report of everything you are doing, and they can hold you accountable. Uh, it is a little pricey if, you know, it's at $13.99 a month now for a family plan, which is actually cheaper than it used to be. Um, but that comes out to about $167 or $168 a year. But that's for um, pretty much, I think it's pretty much unlimited number of users and devices. So uh, that's a good one. And then Net Sanity. Now, this one is a little bit different than some of the others in that it's kind of like this on your device. So it isn't just an app. Some of the, um, like the Covenant Eyes and the other ones I'm going to talk about, they are um, an app that you put on your device, okay? This is it, this goes further than that. It actually puts a profile on the device, and that profile is basically run through their servers, which kind of act like the router protection I was talking about, and keep that device from being able to go to uh, websites that you don't want it to. It also gives you a lot of app monitoring capability. You can turn on or off access to a lot of different apps, um, the apps that are concerning people especially I will um, just mention on my website at sensiblecyberparenting.com, 
I have a, a blog post that I continually update that's called App Watch, and it's got a description of the various apps that parents should be concerned about. There, not every app on there, I would say, is one you wouldn't let your child have. There's some on there that I let my child, children have, but you at least need to know about it. If you're going to, you need to know what they're capable of, or um, maybe that you really need to crank down the privacy settings on that, you know, that kind of thing. And then there's some apps on there that I would just totally avoid. But it gives you information about each one, and I do keep that continually updated when I run across a new one of concern. So net sanity, the other thing um, I wanted to say about them, or a few other things, they are Apple only. Okay, so if you're, a, you're an all Apple family, this may be for you. Um, their support is outstanding. Um, I've gotten immediate responses when I've uh, sent them emails, and, and they even will send out an email when there's an outage. Um, they, you know, like the other day, there was a, a server issue with one of the servers that they were communicating with, and so their service was down, which would mean that anybody who was using their service, their device couldn't do much <laughs> or couldn't get on the internet. So they sent out an email and said, this is the problem, it's a server here. It really wasn't their problem, but because their relationship with that other uh, company and their servers, it was. So they, they have outstanding support and um, it is pricey though. So they do offer, um, pretty much, I mean, there, there seem to always be a discount available, and they have multi-user discounts available, too, so if you sign up for more than one uh, user, uh, because it's, it's per month, per device, uh, not really per user, per month, per device, but there's um, multiple discounts, it is, and it's a sliding scale. And I will tell you, I did see today that they are offering a Veterans Day. I know today's Veterans Day, so you may not have time to take advantage of it, but they are offering 50% off. And so there is a code, and it's not in my slides because it was kind of too late when I found out about it, but it's, the code is VET, as in veterans, VET Day 50. So, uh, and that is, you know, that's a significant discount. So, uh, but I, I do really like this product um, for just the controls that it gives you. But like I said, it is pricey, I understand that. I went the wrong way. Okay, Net Nanny is another um, staple kind of in the parental control industry. They've been around a long time and their product has gotten better and better. Uh, they now have Apple and you know the iOS and then Android also. Um, on those, however, the, the reviews are not as good as on the computer product, okay? Because that's where they started, that's what they, you know, uh, are kind of known for, and so they're trying to get into the, the obviously over the mobile devices, and the reviews are pretty low on it, but it's still um, a good enough product overall that I wanted to mention it. The, the nice thing also is that you can get 10 licenses for large families, you know, for $79 a year, so uh, that, that is uh, a pretty good price when you're, if you have multiple devices, and I'm sure that they're the iOS, the mobile device, Androids, the, it'll get better, um, but right now those kind of have low reviews. MobySip is one that I've been with pretty much from the beginning. Um, you probably are thinking, how many does she have? Well, because of what I do, I, I've used a lot of these products. My poor children have been the guinea pigs for all of this, and they do complain about that a little bit. They're, Mom, I don't want to be another guinea pig. But, um, you know, now I've, I've started kind of getting them involved in the uh, product valuation, you know, kind of help me out here, guys. Uh, and they're, they're older, um, so they, they appreciate that a little bit more now, but they do complain a little bit about how many different things I've tried out on them. Uh, but MobySip has developed from just an app that was free um, on iPhone or iPad to now they've got a broad array of products. And uh, they do not have a Mac, okay, but they do have the um, iOS um, offering. So. The, the really different, or one really different thing that I really like that, that Net Sanity needs to probably get is the ability to um, just disregard a certain network. If you uh, have a school network that has its own controls in place, 
Then you add another control on top of that. Sometimes they don't play so nice together, and then you end up with really poor performance on your device. So the uh, exempting of the school network, or whatever network, um, you, that really is a nice feature that MobySIP has, and I'm guessing NetSanity will probably do that pretty soon because we had some issues with our school <laughs> and NetSanity, so uh, I have a feeling they'll be working that way. It has a YouTube filter, and I will just say, I'll take this time now to talk about YouTube. YouTube is um, a problem because so many people like it. There are a lot of cute, funny, inspirational, whatever videos, but there's also some, you know, nasty stuff. And so it is difficult. The things that I advise, either, first of all, block it all together, and you can, you know, if you make that choice or your child's ages are set, you just... We're not going to do that. Um, but as they get older, you know, the schools are using YouTube. The teachers are using YouTube, and they say, go to YouTube and look at my video. And so it's really hard to block YouTube. But what you can do, first of all, MobySIP has a YouTube filter on their app. So that would be on your device. Also, you can um, you set up an account. It actually is a Google account because YouTube and Google are, you know, kind of related now. Um, but you log that account in with a password that your child does not know, and then you tell them that that account must always remain logged in. Every, and so when you pull up the YouTube app, it has to be logged in on that. And then, and same for the computer. So the only way it logs out is if you log it out yourself or if they were to log it out. Well, if they log it out and they don't know the password, they can't log it back in. So basically you're saying, this always needs to stay logged in, and then if it's, logged, if it's logged in, you can see their history. You can see it keeps track of everything you've been looking at. And so that's one solution I have. It's not perfect, but for children that are older and perhaps, you know, you're wanting to give them a little free reign and some uh, uh, accountability, uh, that is, that's one solution I've come up with. But the MobySIP browser app also does have YouTube filtering. And the basic one, the great thing also is that it's free. If you just want to use the basic, um, you know, app, then, then it doesn't cost anything. So MetaCert, I mentioned that earlier. They are the ones who are trying something like the OpenDNS router that I was talking about. Um, it's not ready for prime time, but they do have an app for the iPad that's really good. Um, they also have a Chrome, um, like an add-in that you can add into your browser and, and turn that on as well. They do have some products, um, and these things are all free. So that, uh, they're, they're definitely an up-and-coming uh, company in this battle. Kids Place is an app for Android. It is free, but it's Android only, and so, uh, but it is a safe browser app. <clears throat> and, we'll, and I'll talk a little bit about how to use those in a minute. Email. Um, email is something of a concern, especially for kids who are littler and they're, and you know, they want to have email, but you just don't know what's going to come in the email, and you're not quite sure you can trust them to manage their email or, or do, uh, do email responsibly. Kids Mail um, is a great way to, to it's, got a, it's a little app that does email. You can set it up very, uh, there, there's a lot of controls. You can control whether you want a copy of the email to come to you before it's released to go to the other person or whether you just want to have a copy sent to you. It's got a lot of ways you can, you can tweak and fine tune it. And it has a teen mode so that as they get a little older, you can, instead of kids, mail.org, uh, your email address would be at, ki at kmail. So it, sound, it doesn't sound so childish. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a great little program. I've been playing with it. My kids already had email. Um, they've had it you know, for a long time, and they weren't, certainly weren't going to go back to this. But I set one up for my dog, and I've been playing with it. And people, my, my, uh, I mean, I gave my dog an account. And so the kids have been emailing the dog, and, and we've been testing it out. And, it, it actually, um, one nice thing is in, on your iPhone, you cannot um, send a picture. Once you've got the email up, you know, you have to do it the other way around. You have to get the picture and then send the email. With kids' mail on your iPhone, you can. So that was kind of a nice little feature, I thought. 
Okay, so um, we talked about the, the proprietary things already, so I'll just kind of skip over that. And then the DNS thing. Uh, this is what I wanted to, I definitely want to make sure, you know, I spend some time on, is the open DNS uh, router setup, because it is so beneficial, and it's so easy, and there's really just not a reason not to do it, and then add some other controls on top of it. So uh, this is just a, from an article of somebody who was uh, touting OpenDNS and, and why they, they thought it would be beneficial. So you're wondering what DNS is probably. It stands for Domain Name Server, and it's basically like the phone book for the internet. It is how the computers know if you're going to go to www.google.com, well, computers don't really know what that means. They don't understand letters, but they do understand numbers. So this is how the numbers and the letters kind of match up, okay? You have DNS servers. There's DNS servers everywhere. I mean, Cox or AT&T, you know, they're going to have their own DNS servers, but OpenDNS has servers that they provide, and they provide them free. And the other benefit is even if you weren't going to do parental controls at all, the open DNS servers help you also to avoid a lot of malware and phishing and things like that just because they want to keep, you know, they keep you away from those things and keep your uh, transfers, you know, as clean as possible or the websites you go to as clean as possible. They're not 100%. All right? Of course, you could stumble on malware, but it is going to minimize that and also um, make your searching and your browsing faster. So what they offer are different, um, they have three different versions, which I'm going to actually go into more on another screen, but uh, <clears throat> they let you block different categories. If you choose the customizable version, there is a family shield that only blocks pornography and doesn't require any setup at all except for putting the numbers on your router, and that's it. But if you would like a little more control and um, the ability to to uh, change your whitelist or blacklist, what that would be is a whitelist would be a list of websites that you say it's okay to go to. Let's say that you want to block websites that um, have to do with, hmm, I don't know, let's see, alcohol, okay? But for whatever reason, there's a website that some must be, it's being blocked because it's alcohol related, but uh, you want to be able to go to that website, you can go in and add it to your whitelist. So that would be allowed even though that category is blocked. Well, the blacklist would be the same way. Blacklist, would be, I mean, it's the opposite. So if you uh, were allowed to go to a website like YouTube, okay, somebody who's blocking pornography, academic fraud, sexuality, and these things could also just block YouTube without blocking the whole category of video sites. So that would be your whitelist and your blacklist. It gives you those controls, whereas if you use the Family Shield version, it does not. It just blocks pornography, these uh, four categories that are uh, pornography related. So this is what their main screen would look like if you were to go to their website, okay? You could choose the OpenDNS Home, that's the free one or you could choose the VIP, or this is the Family Shield. Then it takes you to a page where you can choose whether you're putting it on a computer or a router. For our purposes, and what I'm talking about, I'm going to say router anyway. So um, you would click on router, and then it shows you all, your diff all the different router brands, and you can, you can um, pick from those, and then it gives you a list of the models of the router, and you can go through and pick and it gives you detailed instructions about how to go on your router. And then to go through the configurations, um, it's got instructions. I just put this on here so you can see that they continue. It's like a whole page of instructions. But I want to, whoops, I'm going to back up. Well, actually, I'm just going to minimize this because I'm going to go in to a router demonstration. I don't want you to be scared of this, okay? It's just a router. And the thing is, is if you um, completely mess it up, which I don't think you will, every, everybody's always afraid they're gonna break their computer or mess up their router. This thing has um, this tiny little 
little hole back here that you can stick a paper clip in <clears throat> and reset it, and then it'll be back to its factory default settings just like when it came out of the box. So anything you were to happen to mess up really bad, I don't think you would, but then you could easily take it back to the factory defaults as it was when you first set it up. So what you would do is you connect it. I just did it without telling you. <clears throat> this is an Ethernet cable. At your router at home, you're going to have one of these that's going into the internet port, and that's going to be going to your, um, your cable modem or your DSL modem. You don't want to use that hole, but you want to use one of the other ports that go to a device. That's what these do. And you're going to take, so you're going to leave it in one end there, and then you're going to put it in the network plug of another device. <coughs> And it's, chances are it may already be connected to a device in your home. It just kind of depends if you're all wireless or not. So we're going to say that I am used this as wireless, so now I'm plugging it in. What you do is then you go to a web browser, and you get rid of the address there. And you're going to type in, and, and this is all, like, whatever um, router you have, in the manual, it's going to tell you how to get to the admin screen on your router. And typically, it is a number like this, 192.168.1.1. And you hit Enter, and it takes you to this screen. Well, it kind of just looks like a web page, right? So just think of it like you're logging into your banking website or something or your shopping website, or, or whatever website you typically would use. And then the book that comes with your router will also tell you what the password is. If you've lost your book, you can Google the default admin password for any router. You can just type in the brand of your router and type in default admin password, and it will tell you. Hopefully, <laughs> you changed your router password to something other than the default, but most people don't. <laughs> so I'm just telling you that if you, if you did, you, chances are it's probably the admin password. I always recommend, just, for, just so you know, don't leave it as the admin, because then anybody can get on your router. OK, so I've logged into my router. Now I'm talking to this router. To set up OpenDNS on here, I just go to the manual internet connection setup. And, you know, if you have a Netgear, it's going to maybe look a little different, but basically there's going to be a place where you can put in manually um, this information. Right down here, you're looking for things that say DNS, and there's usually always two, two, sometimes there's three, but you always want to just do the, the first two. And then these are the numbers which OpenDNS gives you on their website. Um, you just put those numbers in. It's 208.67.222.222. And then the other one is the same thing, but 220.220. And that's in their, it's on their website. It's you know, part of their instructions, certainly. Uh, and that's all you have to do on the router itself, which is typically the, things that scare, the thing that scares most people. So you click uh, Save, and then it says nothing has changed because I already had it in there. But then I would say it would save it. And then it will typically need to reboot. It says Reboot Needed, and then I can say Reboot Now. And then my router will reboot. And that part has been done. Now, the other thing that has to be done for uh, OpenDNS to work is and it's called the OpenDNS updater. Okay? What you have to do is OpenDNS needs to be able to make sure that it can communicate, their servers can communicate with your computer and you're all on the same page. Most of us at home have what's called dynamic um, IP addresses for Cox or AT&T. If you know that you have a static IP address at your home, then this would not apply. But if most people don't, okay? So you would download this little thing. It's called the OpenDNS Updater. It's on their page. Um, and just so you know, my website gives instructions about OpenDNS and how to, how to do it and um, links you to their pages and so forth. You download this little updater, and it just runs on your computer all the time. And it basically just says, hello, I'm here. You know, let's make sure we're on the same number. And then 
you uh, go into your OpenDNS dashboard, which you have set up an account. And to get to the screen that I showed you before where it has the pictures of all the routers, you had to have set up an account. And that's how all these products work, really. I mean, you have to go and you set up an account. And it's typically just your email address. Sometimes it's the credit card number if you're paying for something. But typically it's your name, your email address, and then um, on, on some of the products you would put your child's you know, profiles and things like that. But on this, it's just the router, so you don't have to do that. And then you go through and you tell it which categories on that other page that you want to block. And then you're done. So there's a few times where you may have to reboot your, not a few times, but sometimes when you're setting it up, you have to reboot the router and, and maybe reboot your computer. But then when it comes back up, then everything is good. And they take you through, their website has very good instructions on how to do the setup and how to test it. And what you do to test it is you go to their website and it's opendns slash welcome. There's a certain page. I put that on my desktop on my computer so I can get to it fairly easily. And I just click on it every once in a while just to make sure that OpenDNS is working because that's how you know. It, if, if you go to a page and it says, you're using OpenDNS, then you know it's working. If you go to a page that says, oops, then it's not. And so then you figure out why. Like I said, nothing is 100%, and it, it's not always set it and forget it. You have to kind of follow up. So that's just a way to check it. Now, just to mention, there are some advanced setups that you can do with OpenDNS. Um, there are ways around the basic OpenDNS. The, uh, they would require someone to try, okay? So if someone, if a child is trying to get around your controls, um, yes, they may get around them if they know, I mean, you can Google how to get around OpenDNS controls. Uh, but they have to be trying. It's not gonna, uh, we're not talking about accidental, uh, you know, stumbling on something accidental. This is your trying. And there are ways to handle that on the router too. Um, it depends on the model of the router. Not all of them give you that capability. This one does. Uh, and I actually have some here that are brand new routers, except for that I've opened the box, plugged the router in, talked to it, and set it up with the advanced settings so that it does have those. And it basically keeps them from being able to do what's called, um, use what's called a proxy server, where it will go around and go to a different DNS instead of using, you're telling it you want it to use open DNS's, DNS servers, and they can get around it. Well, this keeps you from being able to do that. And so it is possible. I know that, you know, I don't, I don't want to scare you all and, you know, make your eyes glaze over. But I just wanted you to know that it's possible. So the basic settings are great. But if you have a concern, if you have a child who has, has um, demonstrated trying to get around your controls before, you may want to go that way, okay? And so I can always um, help you with that. Or I have these routers. Um, these routers cost me $66, and um, I will sell them for $25, you know, for the setting up over that. So if anybody is interested, they're here, and you're, you know, welcome to come see me afterwards. <coughs> if you happen to be in the market for a router, they work. These are those advanced settings that I was talking about, and um, you can access those on my website if you need to. It is... <laughs> You know, I, I understand <laughs> that it's uh, something a little bit over, you know, I don't want everyone to get scared. Okay, the other, um, the other device that I wanted to demonstrate, kind of, without actually being able to demonstrate a phone, was the iPhone, because that seems to be the one that the majority of the kids, at least that I see, that they have. And these, um, all, this all involves taking a safe browser app and putting it into place and turning off Safari. And what I recommend, um, because so many of these are free, I recommend giving them choices, giving, putting as many free um, safe browsers as you want on there, because then if they're having trouble with one working, they can just flip to the other one, you know. Because, uh, you know, there are times where maybe one might not work as well. So this is the settings screen on the iPhone. 
and you go in there, and then you would choose um, the general. So you would click here, and then go into settings, the general settings. Now, I know for some of you this may be like, I do that all the time. Um, so when you, whoops, I should, I, I skipped something. Restrictions, you wanna click on restrictions, okay. Then you enter your restrictions passcode. If you haven't set one up already, then there'll be one to set up. You have to enter it twice. And then just while we're on codes and passwords, what I would do on all of your parental control devices, for your sake and your children's, <laughs> if at all possible, um, use the same password, or at least if you have one that's four digits and then maybe you have one that has to be longer on some other products, use the same two passwords all the time, but don't, but make sure that your children don't know them, don't have access to them, and so forth. But if, and if you suspect they've found out, well then change them, but it's, it's, it's kind of a problem, and it can cause more, you know, more strife in the family if every time there's a problem where you need to go in and change something, you gotta go, I gotta go find the password, and you go find it, and it takes all this. It's better if it's something you can memorize, boop, 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 see? Okay, here you go. Parental controls aren't a big deal, you know? They're not an inconvenience, so the, the kids will, you know, accept them a little bit more. Uh, so you put your password in, set that up, then, if you wanted to totally disable restrictions, for whatever reason, you could. But what we're talking about here is just turning off Safari. And uh, then, if you turn that off, they don't have access to Safari. Another thing you might want to consider is installing and deleting apps. This is an age-appropriate decision. I mean, you kind of need to decide how old they are and, and so forth, whether that is going to be something that you'll want to do. But uh, especially deleting apps. Because once they've installed it, if they can't delete it, you know, in something they shouldn't have downloaded, then you'd see it there. Now, you should still always have access to their iPhone, I mean, a, a iTunes account, if you're not all using the same account. Some families do, some don't. But you should always have the password to any account they have for anything on the computer. And that, you know, includes Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, whatever. But you would, you can always go see their purchase history there. So that's another option. When you get back to the restrictions, one of the things here under the allowed content, and this is like further down, if you could scroll down on the previous page, this is what you'd see. You can set the ages for movies and music and those kind of things. Um, apps, I would certainly not, um, unless your child is, you know, really old, I would not do anything past the 12 plus, um, because the other 17 plus, that's pretty much almost adult. Um, that's almost all. Um, so that, that would limit them on what apps they could use. And unfortunately, not all apps that um, sh they maybe shouldn't have, have age restrictions, but it at least helps. Another thing that you may want to do is look at location services. This is further down. If you scroll down even further, it comes to, comes to privacy and then location services, okay? This is just one that was on my phone when I shot these screenshots, um, the weather app. Okay, well, that's fine. But what you're looking at more for kids, it's going to be if you're letting them have Instagram or things like that, the location information. Um, that is where there's a concern. If, it's, if an app would somehow broadcast their location where a stranger could, you know, know where they are, that would be the concern there. And then further down even on the restrictions is um, the accounts. And then Find My Friends. I don't know um, how many of you know about Find My Friends, but it's an app that came with the previous iOS system. And if you set it up on your phone and your child's phone, then uh, you always know where they are. You can pull up the, you can pull them up on your, on your phone, and you can see where they are, which is really nice. <laughs> so, um, it's uh, it's a good little thing to have, I think. But um, these are some other things. The volume limit could also be if they listen to music all the time. You may want to, especially if they're little, uh, check that. 
Okay, so not everyone needs the most advanced settings, like these, the, the ones I was talking about here. And um, the, the thing that I try and try and try to stress to people is prevention and starting young, because hopefully uh, they will not have stumbled across it and they will not be inclined to. Uh, and maybe, you know, you've put enough restrictions in place to kind of set the standard. And so if they're not a, a child that, you know, tries to uh, go around things, then if they're compliant, you know, you have to kind of be honest about uh, your child's personality. But uh, you just really want to start young and focus on prevention because that is going to hopefully, in many, many cases, most cases, I would say, keep them from trying to go around the things later, okay? And if you have peop uh, someone or a child in your family who's trying to get around them, you can always take more drastic measures if you need to. Uh, I would urge you to, you know, visit my website um, periodically just to check back and see what new stuff is there. You can even, there is a, an option to give your email address and you'll get an email when I make a new post. So if I post new information on the blog, uh, maybe a new product or something like that, you'll get an email. You won't get any other junk, I promise. But that is an option if you want it to. And, you know, if you don't have a family friend or uh, somebody that you know that's good with technology, you can call someone like me. You know, I don't do these seminars to generate business for the Computer Monkey because there's some weeks where I think I'm pretty busy as it is that I really need anymore, and I really want to empower you all to... Um, I want parents to feel comfortable. I want them to, to not be scared of it. Um, but if it's just over your head or you just hate it or whatever and you just really want to um, have somebody do it um, that you have to pay, well, you're welcome to call me, of course. But I really want you to feel like you can do it yourself. Um, and, and I do understand um, not liking something and just feeling very uncomfortable with it. I had a very uh, good example of this last week where I was invited to go to one of those... Um, paint uh, parties where you paint the, you know, everybody paints the same picture, and uh, there's a guy demonstrating how to do it, and you think, oh, that's going to be great, and I was kind of curious about him. I thought, I'm not an artist at all. I'm not creative. I can't do anything like that, but I thought, well, maybe I can do that. Maybe that'll be kind of fun, and so I'd gotten invited to one, and I thought, I'm going to go, and I went. I hated every minute of it. I could not wait for it to be over. And so I thought that's how the people that I deal with that hate computers and are scared of computers, that's how they feel when they are um, having to work on computers. So I understand. I had a, I had a little lesson in that myself. So um, just if you, uh, if you have to, you know, of course you can call me or there's other people. But, but I would urge you, because I'm not going to name names of businesses, but there's going to be, there are going to be some computer tech people that are going to be more understanding about parental controls, and there are going to be others that are going to roll their eyes because they probably think porn is great, <laughs> okay? So I don't know. I mean, I don't know of any particularly. I'm just saying you, would, you want to pick somebody who at least, you know, agrees with you. And, oh, yeah, I've done that for other people. I know, you know, what to do and who, who has done it and who understands. Because then you're going to get, uh, I think, better options. Okay, so um, just a few things I do want to make sure you all are aware of. There are bad apps out there. There are apps that hide things. There is an app that looks like a calculator that hides videos, hides pictures. So you just need to be aware of it, okay? And there's, there's things like that out there. So you want to investigate the apps your children want to buy. Um, I definitely recommend looking at their privacy, at the privacy settings. And I even, I mean, for myself, I, I lock down my privacy settings pretty tight. And I would certainly urge you to do that on your, on your children's accounts if they have Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. And you, um, you access all of those things through the settings pages on the account. And uh, they do change very frequently. But 
you know, it's something that you do need to keep up with. The app watch, I mentioned that on my website. I have a much longer list than this, apps that you need to be aware of because of cyberbullying and, and just um, access to pretty bad content and uh, some cyberbullying issues and some, some uh, exposure issues where, you know, they could expose themselves, uh, you know, saying things maybe to the world that you probably don't want them to say. Uh, search engines, okay, this is a little bit of an, an issue because of images, you know, they search, you search for pictures. OpenDNS and the other um, controls aren't always going to stop those because they kind of are stored in, in, a, in a, it's called a cache, but they're, they're, they're already stored on servers, whereas they might block the website, but they're not going to necessarily block the image. That happens sometimes. So if you set up your Google, uh, your Yahoo, whatever your search engine is, if you use one of the main ones like Google and Yahoo and those, they, um, they've got these settings now with safe search. And it's the same kind of thing where I was talking about with YouTube. If you, you have to log into it, you leave the account logged in, and then safe, you, you set the settings that safe search is on, and then that way, any searches um, will block those kind of pictures. And they, they do work uh, pretty well. But that's, again, kind of a layered approach. I mean, you've got the router protected, and then you've got some other things protecting. You, you, you want to try to hit all the, all the areas where it's possible. But I would, I would urge you to be cautious, especially with your young children, if they are going to be searching for something even for school or whatever in an image search. And that's Google Images and uh, Bing Images. They have all those. So I talked about the YouTube already. There are some other concerning websites like um, Vimeo, Break.com, Daily Motion, Metacafe. I would urge you to investigate those because YouTube is mild compared to some of the stuff on those. Vine is one you definitely need to be aware of. Um, GIF porn is, um, these are like six second videos because that's what Vine does. And, and, you know, someone's Vine video might be perfectly innocent, you know, their um, puppy rolling around on the floor or something, but it could also be pornography. So it's, uh, and, and Snapchat used to just be pictures, but now it's video too. So Snapchat and Vine, you know, could be concern. Um, it's up to you if you, of course, if you want to let your chil children have it or not. You just need to be aware of what it can do and monitor their account. Um, you know, you can be in their friend list so that you see exactly what they're doing. And I did want to mention this product. It's called I a virus social shield. It's free. And it lets you, um, and it's in your packet. I tried to include in the packet things that you can take home. When you get home, you go, now, what was it she said about, you know, these places you can go to find out uh, about the products. And so that's the kind of information that's in your packet, so you can go there later. But it, uh, it's really good with Facebook. I haven't really gotten good results with Twitter. But Facebook, let me tell you, it will show you if, if you're... Um, son was talking about guns. My, my son had posted something about, we were all at a, a family, uh, at a friend's like ranch, and they had been shooting guns, you know, and he said something and took a picture of these guns. and It was perfectly innocent, you know, but it alerted me on that. And so uh, also like a message to the youth director, he had said something about a party tonight, or maybe she had said something about party tonight, and it came up with a, you know, on my, on my uh, report. So it, it does work. Now, I've mentioned my website, and, and you can follow me on Twitter. I do tweet quite a bit of information about parental controls and things. Uh, so just to wrap it up, I know I am kind of need to hurry. Um, the router controls, that's the number one thing I say everybody should do. There's really no reason not to. It is such, I mean, it's just that extra layer of protection, and it's so easy, really, uh, and free. So. Definitely that, and then all the mobile devices and other devices as needed. Watch their data allowance because a high amount of data, I mean, I, we don't let our children have very much data for that. That's mainly the reason. Because if there's a high amount of data usage, uh, that's kind of a 
a clue, possibly, uh, because you know videos and things like that that you're going to get associated with pornography are going to eat up a lot of data. Okay, you want to um, put safe browsers on their mobile devices, monitor the apps that you let them have that they're buying or that you know they're using, and um, possibly monitor their social media with a vira, but at least have the password to their account where you can go on and, and, and look at it, or just be one of their followers or friends. And you want to set clear technology rules in the house that, that, that everybody can relate to and, and handle, and they're not too, you know, they're not too onerous. You don't want it to be a hassle, because if it's a hassle for you and a hassle for them, you won't do it. Uh, they won't want you to do it. They'll complain too much. And uh, be honest about your child's temperament. Are they compliant? Are they rebellious? And be willing to be inconvenienced. Um, it is a little bit of an inconvenience, but it's important. Also, if you've um, set up some controls and the device completely loses all of its settings or gets wiped, you know, just be aware just make a note, like, mm, okay, if it happens again, <laughs> I would be really suspicious because they just don't lose all their settings that often. Um, so just, just be aware. And I would say start young and keep talking throughout their childhood, I mean, about sex and God's healthy view of sex. This is just a series that we have. I'm sure there are others, but it's called the Learning About Sex series, and it talks about um, you know, sex from the godly perspective and what God's intentions um, are for it. And it's very, very age appropriate in different books for different stages. And so that way, you know, they're informed with the good material, even if they are faced with the bad. So um, use the media too. When you see a commercial that's exploiting women, you know, as it's, as it's age appropriate, you know, point it out and go, well, you know, this is why this is bad. Um, and I would just, I've mentioned some of these things before, but, you know, be um, aggressive in a, in a nice way, I guess. You know, be a warrior for your child when you're dealing with a company over a product, when you're at the store deciding whether to buy it or not. Inquire about their parental controls and, you know, uh, demand them with your purchases you make. Um, that, that would just be my soapbox there, but... Um, these are some ways that kids can get around. They can search for a pornographic word or a, you know, a term of some sort in another language. Uh, there are password cracking programs. These are just things you need to be aware of so you're not naive. Um, you can boot into another operating system with a flash drive. You can boot the computer into Linux. And it looks just like Windows a lot of times. So just be aware of it so you're wise to it. Uh, the proxy websites, we talked about the settings, the advanced settings take care of that. And it is possible to go from an, to another computer remotely and then jump from that computer that's not protected to one that is um, bad, that, that you don't want them to get to. Very important thing to mention, I think, is that desire really does equal effort, okay? If they are trying that hard to get around your controls, there really could be a serious problem. And it could also be that they're just really curious. Or I've also heard of kids who just really like the challenge, okay? So it doesn't mean necessarily that your child has a pornography problem. I'm just saying be aware of it. It could um, if they are that, if they're trying that hard. If there is a problem in your home, these are some, and I think you probably have that on the resources um, page, but uh, these are some people, and they're, they're in your packet too. If you needed help uh, for your family, these people are um, very good and, and deal with these kind of things all the time. And I just would like to remind you that God does want to help you, and he is our rock and our fortress and our shield, and we can count on him after we take the steps that we need to do. We need to be the good stewards and then pray about it uh, and let him handle the rest. So if you will, um, I'm going to,
pray this prayer, if you'll bow your head and you can pray uh, with me silently or you can say it along. I don't, I don't care. Gracious Lord and provider of every good and perfect gift, thank you for everything that is good about our computer connections. Thank you for the skills and the resources you have given us to protect our families from what is evil in those connections. Bless the steps that we take with the resources you've provided us. Where our efforts fail, we humbly ask you to be our family fortress and supernaturally intervene to keep our children safe from the content that could cause them harm. Work in our children's lives, Father, so that they are offended by the things that offend you and that they delight in what is good and righteous and that they have the proper response to both. In the beloved name of Christ, amen. And that's also, that prayer is also in your packet uh, to take home. So now um, I've gone a little long, but we uh, wanted to take some questions if you had any, and then I'm available afterwards to come up and ask too. So. Thank you, Diana. I appreciate it. I do want to, uh, we'll, it's eight o'clock, so we're going to stop. And if anyone wants to stay around and ask questions, that'd be fine, but we're going to let you go. I do want to say, uh, finish up where Diana started, and that is uh, be calm and do something. Go ahead. Uh, these are some surveys that they're short, a few questions. would like you to fill that out and just give it back to us or lay it on the table out in the back as you leave. Um, but be calm and do something. We hope you don't leave here and do nothing. Uh, Diana gave a lot of options. I have gone over many of those, not all. I will tell you. Um, I don't think my system is perfect, but I will tell you what Janelle and I have done. Uh, three things. Okay, first of all, we have open DNS in our router. It works. It, it actually works. I have open DNS on my router. Okay, and it's not hard to do. Um, if you have questions, call Diana. She'll help you. Okay. I have covenant eyes. I researched several, and I have covenant eyes on my iPhone. Okay, and on my laptop, on my desk in my office right now. So I did open DNS, covenant eyes. It's a little pricey. It's worth 165 bucks a year. I have 10 children. Okay, it's worth 165 bucks a year to me. Uh, and then I have Google Safe Search turned on. So I have a multi-layered approach. It's not foolproof, but I it hadn't failed me yet. I don't mean me, I mean my family. Um, so that's the three I've done. There's some others, I'm not discounting any of the others, but uh, that's what I researched and looked at and settled on, and um, that's where I am right now. And I'll probably be somewhere different in a year from now, but for right now, that's where I am. And I actually upgraded. I actually did that just in the past year, Open DNS. I switched from K9, which was a free uh, app browser, to Covenant Eyes, which is not free. So I've upgraded even my home and our devices, uh, and then we take some other parental steps, which you can talk to me about that if you want. Um, you don't have to be as strict as I am with my children, <laughs> but uh, we take some steps to make sure things, or to minimize the possibility of things happening. So uh, with that, thank you for coming, and if you could fill out that survey and just give it to one of us or leave it on the table at the back, that'd be great. If you have any questions for me or for Diana or Kyle Smith, our CHA, IT director's here. Uh, he's really good as well. That is it. Thank you for coming, and I uh, hope you have a good cold rest of the evening. Good night.